Hi, this is Nick Freitas, and welcome back to Making the Argument. Today, we have a special by request episode. We want to thank Brianna Joe for in our community chat. So um, let me lay it out this way. Uh, once upon a time, there was a young woman. And this young woman was raised on a healthy diet of fourth wave feminism, right? Everyone in her life, from her parents to her teachers, her friends, the, the artists that she appreciated and respected and listened to and watched, and read, all reinforced the ideas and philosophies around feminism, wokeism, progressivism, you name it. She grew up completely immersed in it to the point where it just felt like reality, like this was just the way the world worked. And as such, she dutifully applied the principles involved throughout every aspect of her life with respect to what she thought, what she did, the occupations that she looked for, the education that she sought out, the entertainment she was interested in was all rooted in this idea and this philosophy. And over time, she started to see problems with it. Subtle at first, but it started to expand. In fact, the more that she started to implement these philosophies, the more she realized that it didn't bring her any sense of purpose or meaning or peace. Now, as she started to question it, as she started to open herself up to new ideas, like at first it, it was this sense, it was this sense of betrayal, almost as if she was turning her back on everything that she believed in, everything that she was committed to, just by entertaining the idea that something else could be right. And so she was very careful in the way that she did it. She would listen to something every once in a while, maybe hear a different point of view, or just take the time to try to understand what somebody else was saying without prejudging what their intentions were. And slowly over time, she started to think that, okay, maybe there's some points here. Maybe there's some points, right? She's not giving up on what she believes, but maybe there's a kernel of truth into the other perspective, the other side of this story which at this point is a massive shift in her worldview. And as she continues to go down this road, at some point she says, okay, maybe they have a point or maybe, and this is a little bit more scary, maybe they're right. And so what she's looking for at this point is not just evidence in what someone says. She's looking for evidence in their life in the way that they treat their spouse and the way that they treat their kids and the way that they live their life and the way that they treat their coworkers, the people around them, the people in need. She's looking for evidence in this person's life, both in what they say and what they do, in order to potentially consider on whether or not everything that she was taught is wrong. And this young woman picks you as the example would she be convinced or would she go running in the opposite direction back to everything that she had been taught, convinced that no matter how bad it had let her down to this point, no matter how bad those decisions had made, no matter how bad they had made her feel, it has to be right because what you demonstrated can't be correct. That's the question that we're going to be tackling today on this episode. We're going to be talking about people that are actually, that are so close to taking that red pill and then asking themselves whether or not it's worth it based off of the people they see around them who have already taken it. All of that and more coming up on this episode of Making the Argument brought to you by Good Ranchers. Hey everyone, and thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Making the Argument. I am really excited for this episode as I'm excited for all episodes that are recommended by our community. If you haven't already, I hope you'll join our community by going down to the link in the description and let's get right into this episode. All right, as always, I am your host, Nick Freitas, a uh, member of the Virginia House of Delegates, but other than that, a relatively good guy. Unfortunately, Queen of the Bees, my beautiful bride, Tina, could not be with us today. But good news, we still have our resident historian and our mostly benevolent warlord in training, Christian Hines. How are you doing, Master Hines? It, uh, I'm, you know, honestly, I could be doing better, but this is a topic that I think is going to kind of lift my spirits because we get to talk about the red pill, baby. This All is, right. <laughs> well, good. Suck it up, it. buttercup. All right. And then, of course, we have our producer of producers, Nicholas Hamilton, the good Hamilton, the one that doesn't like central banking. I'm ready. Let's get to it. Okay. So let, let's jump into this. What, what does it actually mean to take the red pill, right? And 
typically that this, uh, from a popular culture perspective, this comes from the movie The Matrix, where you know he takes Neo and Neo senses that there's something wrong with the world, right? That there's some sort of glitch in the system and he's not quite sure what it is. And he meets this guy, Morpheus, right? And Morpheus hands him two pills, right? The red pill and the blue pill. The blue pill basically puts him right back to like, it's like nothing ever changed, right? You just go right back into the environment that you've always been in. And, and we don't disrupt anything with your happy little life. The red pill, right, shows you just how deep the rabbit hole goes, right? That's, that's what taking the red pill is. And of course, Neo takes the red pill and we have, you know, the, we have the Matrix um, series. And so we, we've associated taking the red pill kind of within uh, the conservative world as somebody that, you know, was, was either maybe they were left of center, maybe they were, you know, far left, whatever it was. Um, but at, at some point, something clicked with them where they realized that the the explanations that they had been given for how the world works, how the world should work, just didn't add up to reality, right? Something was wrong with it. Um, and there's usually, you know, certain conditions and then a catalyst, right? Something big that happens. Um, we, we've referred to it before as getting mugged by reality, right? When When all of a sudden the explanations that you used to think explain the world fail you, and now you're looking for where's the truth, right? Where's the truth? And a lot of times people will go through various stages of this, right? Because there's there could be a sense of betrayal, there could be a sense of frustration, there could be a sense of disbelief, all of those things. You might try to hold on to some of those beliefs while adopting other ones, but that's what the red pill is, right? It's, it's taking that and changing away from the way you, you used to think about something to the way you think of it now. And what we're going to talk about first and foremost with this is that we've got a lot of people that because of COVID, because of what you might call wokeism, uh, we have a lot of people that used to be firmly established on the left that have essentially been red pilled either in whole or in part, right? And this, this is there's there's a history of this happening throughout time. But when you have a, a lot of things kind of coalescing and taking place all at once, like we have, again with COVID, with the Trump administration, with various wars going on around the world. There's been a lot of things that have caused people to wake up very quickly and question the things that they used to take for granted. And I'll give you a perfect example of this. Five years ago, 10 years ago, Elon Musk was an absolute darling of the left, right? He was kind of this, this quirky innovator who was all about you know electric cars and green energy and saving the planet through technology. And the left pretty much loved him. They, they saw him as, as one of theirs. Right. Joe Rogan was another guy that maybe the left didn't like fully embrace, but he was still seen as someone that was being solidly in their camp. Right. You asked Joe Rogan who he who he liked for president. He might have said Bernie Sanders. And you see this with other people as well. Jordan Peterson used to be a member of the Socialist Party in Canada. Right. But various conditions and then certain catalysts all brought them to a point where they decided to reject either a, a significant portion of the worldview that they previously held or parts of it. Bill Maher might be another example with respect to what's happened with free speech. So the issue is, is that we, we run into this, we run into this question all the time, kind of within like the libertarian movement or the conservative movement or whatever you, whatever you want to call it, that, that, that movement that is more focused on the idea of free markets and individual liberties and, you know, the, the right to live your life the way you want, provided you don't infringe on the rights of others to do the same, right? There's always this question of how embracing are you of the people that are going through this kind of transition and understanding where they're at and what it means for them to actually take the red pill. And that's what we're going to discuss today. And the, and the there's three parts to this that, that we're going to go through. Um, part of it has to do with understanding the operational environment, right? That's a term I like to use a lot because it applied a lot to me in the military where I would go into an environment where the culture I was operating in, the, the geography, the weather, everything might have been very, very different from what I grew up with, but my, my job was to effectively operate. And in order to do that, it started with understanding the operational environment. So we're going to talk about that first. Then we're going to talk about we're going to talk about understanding what your job is or what your responsibility is with respect to the things that you believe and how do you, you know, how do you effectively, you know, convey that, right? And that's going to be the third part, right? So the step one, understand the operational environment, understand the people that you're talking to and the conditions that have led them to believe the things that they believe. Number two, understanding your responsibility, right? Your responsibility, 
Um, is are you are you just are you just there to go off by yourself, live your life, and that's it, and you really don't care what happens to the world around you, or are you going to engage in the culture with the idea of winning? And that's part three. How do you actually win, right? How do we actually convince somebody? That whole story that I said in, in the opening uh, of someone, and it could be a, it could be a woman that it's all about feminism. It could be a guy that has grown up with like woke progressivism, whatever it might be. It's that person who wholeheartedly was a, was a true believer who is now starting to question things and how do you effectively engage with that person who is who is willing to give you a, hear, a hearing? Because we have a problem. and the, We have a problem in this movement. Sometimes we end up driving them away immediately with the way that we behave toward them. And sometimes we let them run the whole show the moment they decide to come over to our side. So let's start off with the first one right now. Let's start off with the operational environment because... Um, I think this is really important. I, I think a lot of people on our side get frustrated either because maybe they always grew up in a, in a family or they always grew up in an environment where the sort of ideas that we talk about, right? You know, individual liberty, personal responsibility, free markets, um, you know, gen, what we would call traditional masculinity or femininity. If these are things that you grew up with, well, then for you, they are obvious. And you may be thinking about this from not only an experiential standpoint, but maybe from a critical thinking standpoint. Maybe you hear this idea that a man can become a woman, and that just seems so on its face absurd that you can't even conceive of how somebody else would not only you know, buy into that, but they, that they would fully embrace it to the point where they would see you as the enemy if you believe anything different. And so the reason why we're going to discuss this operational environment is because there's certain things I think we need to understand about how woke progressivism and and when we say woke progressivism what we're what we're to, in order to define our terms here what we're generally talking about is a philosophy or a worldview that is rooted in this identity is is rooted in this idea that the world is broken down into two categories the oppressors and the oppressed and the way that the oppressed are going to get out from under the yoke of of the oppression or the oppressors is they're going to consolidate political power Right, and they're going to control the various institutions, and they're going to turn those on on their heads, so that now that those institutions are working on their behalf in order to achieve equity within society, and there, there's a couple components to this, right, that that are seem to be frequent and constant, no matter who the woke progressive is that you're talking about. One, they always they always tend to believe in the expand the consolidation of political power in the hands of people like them. And they believe in using political institutions and power in order to order society in order to achieve what they call equity or, you know, social justice or whatever else it might be, right? So let's talk about that kind of first point, this idea of group identity and, and why this is such, um, such an alluring philosophy uh, for some people. And I think... I think uh, there's a book out there that I would I would recommend people read. I don't necessarily agree with everything in it, but it was a book called Eric Hoffer, and the, it was called The True Believer, and it was discussing the the origin and the nature of mass movements. And one of the things that he really gets to in this book is this larger discussion of you know why would why would a person kind of give up their individual identity in order to be associated with a group identity. And one of the things that he talks about in that book is this idea of the removal of responsibility, the removal of personal responsibility. Because it's easy to talk about freedom if you're not personally responsible, right? It's easy to talk about what you should be free to do or what you should have or what the group should have if you're not personally responsible for anything, if you're not personally responsible for achieving those things. And so if you get your identity through the group as opposed to an individual, it kind of takes the heat off and it gives you a sense of family. And this is something Christian and I have talked a, a lot about when it comes to, again, the nature of mass movements and whatnot. It's this idea that sometimes we like to talk about like, oh, individual liberty and personal responsibility. And, you know, yeah, you have a sense of community, but rugged individualism, right? That terrifies some people. And, and Christian, you know, I, I went to, I mean, I went to college, but mine, mine was more of kind of an unconventional experience with college. It was some in person, some online. I mean, you, you were right there on the college campus. I mean, when it, what did you see with respect to this, I, this kind of opposition between individual identity or group identity 
within like the college setting? That's a good question, especially because you're asking me questions from 10 years ago. Um, so <laughs> let, let, let me think back to my my young days as a college student. Now, okay, so when I went to, to college for my undergrad and I went to James Madison University in Harrisonburg, Virginia, um, attended it for three and a half years. I was able to graduate early for a semester, uh, a semester early. So that way I could actually go work for Nick in Richmond. And yeah. um, I remember, and I also majored in political science too, which by the way, my recommendation to anybody who's like 18 or in high school, <laughs> don't major in political science. Um, I work in politics for a living and my degree is utterly useless. Um, Nick did not hire me because I got a political science degree. He hired me because we had known each other for years. But um, I mean, sorry, I just needed to throw that out there. But um, <laughs> okay, so so to answer your question about like, you know, group identity, collectivism versus individualism, I, I, I if you allow me to reframe that for, for just a little bit, I, I feel like that, that, especially on universities itself, it's, it's more... I mean, what you hinted at earlier, the oppressor versus oppressed dynamic. And that manifests itself in a group mentality, but it doesn't begin with, oh, we're seeking to establish a group mentality and, and you know, we want to be, a, you know, a bunch of tribalist lunatics that, you know, believe that men can become women and that two plus two equals five and that indigenous science is superior to the actual scientific method and, you know, so on and so forth, right? I think that that's the logical end result of the thought process that universities cultivate, but I don't yeah. think that's the starting point. And so like collectivism in many respects, I feel like is a byproduct of the thought process that that is is perpetuated within the university system. What I think the university system is increasingly doing is encouraging students to basically revolt against the natural order of the world itself. Mm -hmm. And what I mean about that is, you know, there's many different ways that you can define left versus right. We can define it as collectivism versus individualism. We can define it as socialism versus capitalism. We can define it as, you know, tyranny versus freedom. Um, but I also think there's another way that you can define left versus right that really kind of exemplifies itself in the university system more than anywhere else. In part because, as Thomas Sowell brings up, in the university system, you're teaching theory. Right. And you yeah. don't necessarily pay a price for being wrong. And so you can teach things that are in complete antithetical to how reality works. And it works fine within the university system because they don't have to pay any consequence for ignoring how reality works as long as the dollars keep flowing in. And I feel like well, that within I, the university system, the last thing that differentiates the left and right, other than those ones that I brought up, that I think really sh shines through in the university system is the, the left, in many respects, I think rejects hierarchies. And the right accepts that they're intrinsic to nature itself. And when I say hierarchies, I don't mean it in an oppressive way where you have like a, a yeah. strong man and then you have, you know, like slaves underneath them. I don't mean that in like a North Korean sense, right? Or a, or a CCP Chinese sense. What I mean is when the right embraces hierarchy, what they, what, what they do is they embrace meritocracy, right? They embrace the best ideas rise to the top, the hardest working rise to the top. This is why the right supports free market economics, because they want that marketplace of ideas. They want competition. They want, the, you know, it's, it's like iron sharpens iron. And so there's an adherence to hierarchy, the natural ordering of the world on the right, rather than a rebellion against it. What the right does is they recognize that the strong triumphs over the weak. What the right is upset about is all too often, and if you go through history, you know this, all too often, the strong are not morally good people. There's no, there, there's, there's no moral equivalent. Y you can be strong or weak, and that doesn't necessarily mean you're a good person or you're a bad person. The yeah. left looks at hierarchies, they look at strong versus weak dynamics, and they immediately either reject the existence of them altogether, they, they pretend it doesn't exist, that there is no distinction between strong and weak, or they assign moral culpability to the strong and moral superiority to the weak by nature of being strong or weak. That manifests mm -hmm. itself in wokeism. Right. And so they either have this utopian egalitarian view of the world where, well, there shouldn't be strong or weak, or they have this idea that, you know, we need to elevate the weak because they are weak and therefore they must be oppressed and therefore they must be good. Whereas the right looks yeah. at history, the right looks at meritocracies, the right looks at hierarchies, and they say strong and weak exist, but they exist independent of morality in the sense that you could be weak and be good. You could be weak and be evil. You could be strong and be good. You could be strong and be evil. And the yeah. tragedy of history is quite often that the blood and treasure of humanity is, is 
spilled at the hands of, of evil strongmen. And so the goal of the right is not to overthrow that natural ordering of the world. The goal of the right is to make sure that the strong are righteous and just, whereas the left well, wants think, to erase it. Well, and I think when you look at, when you look at like group identity or the like kind of the allure of collectivism, again, if, if you're someone that believes in this idea of meritocracy and you're someone that has experienced it even on a small level, right? Like you've worked hard and you've achieved something and you've seen a benefit from it. What, what you now have is a natural built, built in incentive to continue to do that. And as long as you feel like you're operating in an environment where your hard work or your talents are effectively rewarded, you tend to embrace that sort of environment. Um, if on the other hand, you feel like the deck is totally stacked against you, well then I think there's an allure to the collective action because it's this idea that I'm not doing bad because I've done something wrong or I'm not doing poorly, whether it's you know financially or physically or I'm not doing because of something wrong with me, it's something else. There, there's there are systems that have been designed specifically against me or people like me or people who look like me or people who identify as me. And so if we can just replace those systems or tear down those systems and replace them with good, equitable, egalitarian ones, well, then everybody's going to be doing better. And, and, I, and I think what's interesting about that goes to the, the old C.S. Lewis quote where, um, and I don't have it in front of me, so I'm going to do my best to, to, but he was basically saying that it might actually be better to be ruled by, you know, robber barons than it would be, um, you know, moral busybodies. And, and his argument was, is that essentially that if somebody is motivated by like greed or somebody is mo motivated by a, a, a desire to benefit themselves, th there may be times where their, their greed um, is satisfied and, and they, and they leave you alone. Uh, but somebody who torments you for your own good will do so without ceasing because they do so with the approval of their own conscience. And this is, I feel like he did such a good job of encapsulating this idea because it is so easy to look at somebody else who disagrees with you on policy or disagrees with you on worldview and think that they're either, you know, ignorant or perhaps unintelligent or evil. And a lot of times I, I, I feel like that's how the left sees me. They sees me as either like it, when they're being generous, they think I'm ignorant. I just don't know. Right. Then when they find out that, no, I, I do know stuff, then I'm stupid. And then when they find out I'm not stupid, the only explanation left to them is I must be evil. Right. I, I must have really, really evil intentions because after all, they're trying to do, why can't I see that they're trying to do good things for me and good things for the common good and, and that's why they need more power and that's why they need more rules and that's why they need more regulations and that's why they need more taxes and that's why they need more whatever it is. But the interesting part of the, about that collective action is that it it you're not only handing over the responsibility to the group um, in, in order to achieve something better for yourself, but you're operating on behalf of the group. And so it, it provides this sense of moral purpose and what you're doing that, oh, this isn't selfish. I'm not, I'm not stealing from that guy to give myself something. You know, we're, we're, um, we're taking back what is rightfully ours that they wouldn't have had in the first place if it wasn't for labor or if it wasn't for our group that they oppressed or did horrible things to. And, and there's a, and because as, as you pointed out throughout history, there's been plenty of examples of the strong or the wealthy taking advantage of the poor or the weak it's an argument that makes sense to a lot of people, especially if they find themselves poor and weak. And, and this is why let, wokeism is so it. alluring, right? Yes. I, I was talking with somebody today on this and, you know, they, they asked the question, it's like, well, do you, do you look at someone different when you find out that they, you know, they made, you know, bad choices or whatnot? It's like, well, no, everybody makes bad choices at some point in their life. The, the real question to, to me comes down to, did they recognize their own agency within the bad choices, right? Did they recognize their own agency? Because even, even in really bad situations where you don't have a lot of control over your life, let, let's say you are in a position where you're being genuinely oppressed, then it might be that you have very little freedom to actually improve your own situation. But you can always tell the difference. This is actually something that they study in like POW camps. The person that gives into the idea that there is no, there, I can't control anything, and so I'm just doomed. 
never does as well as the person that says, yes, I'm in a circumstance where I control next to nothing, but the little bit I can control, even if it's my own mind, I will maintain control of that. I will take personal responsibility for it. And I will use that to improve my situation to whatever degree possible. That person always does better. And I think the allure of collectivism is this idea where I get to give up responsibility for my circumstances in exchange for whatever the group goals are or whatever the group identity is. And one day, if we all work together, we're going we're gonna to retake the power that was always rightfully ours, and then we'll show the people that hurt us. And, and again, if, if the problem is, is that you might have an individual situation where there is some element of justice to that. Or there may even be a group situation. I mean, clearly people that were enslaved could look back at the people that enslaved them and say, you you guys engaged in systematic and group oppression of all of us, and, and we rose up above that. The problem is, is that when all of a sudden, when, when the desire for grievances, when the demand for grievances outweighs the supply, well, then all of a sudden the group identity politics doesn't work. The mission doesn't work. The purpose or goal doesn't work. You have to manufacture grievance at that point. And you have to manufacture grievances. And that's one of the things that when I look at like wokeism and intersectional politics, you know, and James Lindsay calls intersectional politics essentially American Maoism. Because when you look at a lot of the things that Mao did uh, in China, you know, he called it Marxism with Chinese characteristics. And, you know, Lindsay calls wokeism, Maoism with American characteristics. It's this idea that there's there's always some entity out there that is holding you back. And the only way that you're going to be able to overcome that entity is that if you join the group and you act collectively, and whenever, whenever you don't, like even when you've got the power, when your plans don't work, it's not because the plans didn't work. It's because someone is still out there that is doing something wrong. And then, and then this part's really important. Inevitably, what happens is somebody that's a part of the group who, who bought into all of it, who fought with you on all of it, who achieved power with you at some point, at some point that person starts to look around and goes, wait a second, we're the ones running the show now and things are still horrible. Or I, I did everything I was told to do and I'm still miserable. Or I still have this longing for something that I was promised I would know have a longing for if, as long as I joined the group. And, and they start to question it. Well, what, in, what ends up happening to them the moment they start to question it within that group? They'll, the group will either surround them and try to isolate them from, from any ideas outside or they will viciously punish them in a way that they wouldn't even punish, you know, what they consider to be their outside opposition. Traitors always get punished, have, you know, more ruthlessly yes. than the enemy does, always. Yes, and and so it's important to understand that if somebody is bought into this kind of, and it, it really is rooted in kind of a Marxist understanding of the world, and whenever you say that, people think, oh, you're calling me a communist. No, I'm not, I'm not calling you a communist. Maybe you are, but I'm not calling you a communist. It may be that you just think that Marx did a good job of explaining the world. You might not think that all of his ideas for improving it are correct, but I think it's it's interesting that when you look at woke progressivism and you look at Marxism, you see a lot of crossover themes with collective action, with the idea that they're bad and we're good, right? They're the oppressors, we're the oppressed. We have to work together. And, and one of the things that was important to understand about Marxism is that it, it didn't end, it wasn't supposed to end with a totalitarian government, right? It was supposed to end with this idea of the dictatorship of the proletariat, right? This perfectly equal egalitarian society where we, where we all just kind of get along and play our, our various roles. And that's very enticing. The problem is, is every time this view of the world, this way of explaining disparity, this way of explaining poverty, this way of explaining oppression, every time it's put into practice, it always leads to more authoritarianism, totalitarianism, oppression, violence, excommunication, right? From the group, if you, if you stray at all, you become a traitor, right? That's what it always leads toward. Well, I mean, Nick, the, the the revolution never ends. Tina and I, it can't. Tina, it can't. It, this is why. This is why the the Chinese military is the People's Liberation Army. Who are they liberating? Yeah. Right. The, yeah. the, the, this is why 
the you know North Korea's propaganda always talks about the revolution. This is why Cuba always yeah. talks about the revolution. This is also why China always talks about the revolution. It can't end. Tina and I did an episode actually without you back in November where it, it was titled like the left wing civil war. I highly encourage our listeners to go back and listen or watch to it if they haven't. In part because they might have skipped it because Nick wasn't there and they might have been like, oh, well, I don't need to watch this one. I It was a fantastic well. episode between Tina and I. I, I. I wish I could relive it because we talked about so much in there about the nature of left-wing political movements and how they evolve and how they inevitably expel their own members or purge their own members because the biggest thing that new right pill or, or red-pilled people go through once they start taking the red pill for the first time is – and in the political context, like um, the 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 new reaction occurs. Yarvin was the first one who applied it in a political sense. He took the the Matrix example from 1999 and applied it to the political sense. And he defined the red pill as anything that disassociates you from the established power structures that he called the cathedral. So basically, mm-hmm. anything that removes you from that that blue pill narrative that the left has indoctrinated you into, right? Once it no longer works and you and you realize that this is a lie, that's when you've taken the red pill. And what happens with a lot of these people on the left is that they go through this process where they declare, I didn't leave the left, the left left me. But the problem is, is that when you say that, you might not be meaning it this way, but when you say that, what you're basically saying is, I'm still on the left. Mm -hmm. And the thing that that you have to go through, and it's a painful thing to go through, and and I've been through it in a much more minor sense because I've always identified on the right. But I know that there are positions that I have held in the past that you could— Well, not in high school. In high school, you probably weren't on the right. Um, There was a brief period before I started you reading Hayek Obama. where I was— <laughs> I mean, I wasn't old enough to vote for Obama. I, I, oh, okay. I And I probably wouldn't have voted for him in 2008. I probably would have voted like third party because I know in 2012 I didn't. I voted for Romney, yeah. which I'm still embarrassed of, but I'm glad I didn't vote for <laughs> Obama. Um, yeah. But like— I, uh, so like, yes, there there were peer. I don't think I ever identified on the left, but I know, and Nick, you know this as well, because we've had like back and forth discussions for a dozen years now about this stuff. There are positions that I held in the past that would have been classified as left wing, even though I was not in totality on the left because yeah, I was always yeah. a free market supporter. Right. And, it, but yeah. like, I was very socially progressive at one point, very socially progressive and I'm not at all now. And so like the reason I bring this up is because If you're on the left and you've started taking the red pill to some degree and you start realizing, no, this is not working, what you inevitably go through is a crisis where you have to to choose what direction to go. And some people go the the Sam Harris route and revert back to being on the left, right? Because Donald Trump has, you know, tweeted something mean and I just can't stand him. And (laughs) we need to, you know, do everything we can to keep him out of like, like Sam Harris was like teetering on the edge for a while. And then Trump came along and then he, he reverted right back to being on the left. Right. Or you cross over the ledge. You either cross over the ledge or you get pushed over the ledge by the left because they purge you. And what I mean by that is there's a lot of people that are perfectly content to support the revolution until it gets to their sacred red lines. And then they 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 stand up and they say, whoa, 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 we've gone too far. This is the point yeah. of no return. This is, a, th- this is dangerous. Like Brett Weinstein, for example, is going out there now saying that like, well, what's happening within the medical profession and the scientific profession, which is where he works, where we're, yep. we're delegitimizing people for denying things like the binary of sex. Richard Dawkins is doing the same thing right now, saying like, this is lunacy. Like there's very few binaries that exist out there. Sex is one of the only ones. Why are people denying this? These are people that were on the left, and in Dawkins' case, is still on the left. Weinstein has started to take the the red pill. There's so many people like this. Jordan Peterson as well that you brought up used to work for the the NDP, which is the Socialist Party in Canada. Um, uh, Dave Rubin used to be on the Young Turks podcast. Like I, I can keep. You're, you're starting to see. You're starting to see other people too on the Young Turks that are starting Anna to Kasparian. ask like, questions. Yeah, and she's going through the same thing because Anna Kasparian was a feminist for a long time. And now she's upset that the word woman is being erased. The definition of the word woman is is disappearing, and she's upset about that. And so the reason I I bring this all all this up is where does this take somebody who's on the left and has started to take the red pill and realizes the revolution's going too far? You either go the Sam Harris route and you revert back to taking the blue pill again and oh, things are weird, but I don't want to rock the boat, or you cross over or you get betrayed and then you get angry because the the left 
discarded you and now declared you a reactionary and a traitor yeah. once you no longer served a useful purpose for them. And the one yeah. thing that the, 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 the self-introspection, you were talking about responsibility earlier, right? One of the most painful things you have to go through. And again, I've been through it on individual issues, but not in terms of identity issues of being on the left, but certainly on individual issues. And so I, I understand how difficult it can be. One of the things you have to understand though is things didn't fly off the rails the second that, that the revolution crossed your sacred line. Mm -hmm. The revolution was the problem, not the fact that it yeah. crossed the line because it was always going to cross the sacred line that you drew in the sand and said, it shouldn't go any further than this. It was always going to end that way. And you're just now waking up to realizing how, how far gone things are. And then you come over to the right and, and some of them get upset because some people on the right respond accordingly and was like, well, you were our enemy until five minutes ago and now you want us to treat you nice. I'm going to treat you poorly. Obviously the right shouldn't do that. But the the biggest thing that, that people on the left need to do is, is approach this with a little bit of humility and a little bit of realization that things have been flying off the rails far longer than five minutes ago when the left crossed my sacred red line. Well, and I think I think that's a really important point. I, I the the biggest thing that concerns me sometimes, like uh, we'll take Elon Musk for example. I think Elon Musk has always been generally, you know, a, a guy that believes in, you know, free market economics. Now, there's going to be a lot of people that just spit their coffee when I say he took government subsidies. I, I get it. I'm not saying it was a, a perfect example. I'm saying that I don't believe he believes we needed to seize the means of production. Right? I don't think he believes that you know we needed to collectivize all industry. So he was never like that on the left. Um, and he, he was obviously an, a, a big adherent and a big believer in the idea of objective reality. And he was a big believer in, in the idea of freedom of speech and freedom of inquiry. The, the thing that I think is important to understand, though, is that, again, one of the things that, and this goes back to the idea of Marx as kind of the founding father of a lot of this, whether, whether he's so far removed that people don't always associate to him. Maybe they do, you know, Marcuse, or maybe they do Foucault or whatever it is, but it, it, all roads tend to lead back to Marx. And you could say somewhere else too. We'll get into that in a different conversation. But um, it, it's all based off of this idea that the Marx understood that the only way for his vision to win was he had to create a new type of person, right? He didn't think it was just a new type of government. He didn't just think it was a new type of economic system. He genuinely believed you needed a new type of person and you weren't going to be able to create that new type of person within the current structure, which was the nuclear family, which was traditional male and female roles, which was a, a belief in God or, or something ab above ourselves or above humanity. He didn't believe any of those things. He thought it was necessary for those things to be removed in order to achieve what he wanted. And so we shouldn't be surprised when people who have kind of adopted several elements of this philosophy you know, get to a point where, again, maybe maybe their sacred, you know, element was, well, I'm a feminist, like J.K. Rowling. I'm a feminist. You're not going to say that women, you're not going to say that anybody can be a woman. And then we we all cheer and it's like, okay, great. We're, we're happy about that. By the same token, though, J.K. Rowling doesn't seem to understand how her definition and her version of feminism led to this. For, for her, she's confused. But if you look at the underlying philosophy, which pushed so much of left-wing, you know, thinking and policy... As Christian said, it's inevitable because the revolution has to keep moving. It has to find new enemies to blame when it when it doesn't achieve its objectives, right? And it ne needs the creation of an entirely new type of person in in order to be successful. Now, here's the here's the sad here's the sad part for collectivists or for for Marxists. You're not going to get that new type of person. Y yes, people can can change the way they think about things. They can change their their value systems. They can do a lot of that. But reality is reality. There is such a thing as objective reality. And, and as Christian likes to say, and, and others like to say, you know, you can ignore reality all you want. You just can't ignore the consequences of ignoring reality. And, and every single regime that has tried to diligently impose Marxist ideology in order to create that new person, and many of them have gone to various varying degrees of, of links in order to, to do so, have always eventually run into the problem of the consequences of reality. But here's what I want, here's what I want the right to understand. Or not even the the right. We'll say the the those of us who again believe in this idea of individual rights, individual liberties, individual responsibility, 
but who also have a strong sense of community, whether that's community within the nuclear family, whether it's community within friends and, or, and voluntary organizations or a voluntary marketplace, right? The, the people that fit within that camp who believe in objective truth, who believe in objective reality and believe those things. One of the things I think we need to do a better job of understanding is, again, our responsibility of understanding this sort of environment that somebody that is considering that red pill is actually in. Because it is really easy to look at it and say, why don't you just understand X, Y, or Z? And what I think we need to come to grips with is you're not just asking them to change their mind on a policy position. You're, you're not just asking them to change their mind with respect to the marginal tax rate. What, what this really means for them is a complete shift in worldview. And that is a scary proposition. It is a, it is a terrifying proposition to think that everything that you so desperately believed in that gave you purpose, meaning, and community was wrong. And now if you give it up, if you even, if you even dabble with the alternative, it's not just going to mean, it's not just going to be the potential embarrassment of having to admit, oh gosh, I guess I was wrong on that. It could be severing relationships with family and friends and organizations that have been your entire world. And some people are going to look at this and say, well, it almost sounds like you're leaving a cult. I might not go to that length, but pretty dang close in some of these, in some of these instances, right? It is walking away from so much more than, than just a political party. And I think, it's, I think it's really, really critical for us to understand that when somebody is willing to step out and be honest about something that they're feeling or they're struggling with, if our immediate response is, well, you know, way to catch up, dumbass. Okay, well, don't be surprised if they say, yep, everything I heard about you was right. You're arrogant, you're rude, you're mean, you don't care. And, and even, if, even if I'm struggling with what I believe, I, what I don't want is what you believe. Because the moment I was honest, the moment I showed vulnerability, you punished me for it. And that kind of goes into the second part I want to talk about here. And is, okay, so what is our responsibility? And, and I think the, the first responsibility that we have to talk about is what's for dinner, which is why good ranchers can answer this question for you, right? Good Ranchers, one of those pinnacle organizations within the free market, an organization that is not forcing you to eat delicious beef, poultry, pork, and wild-caught seafood. No, no, no. No, in a sense of voluntary cooperation in the marketplace, they are offering you a good end service. And they're saying, look, we're, we're out here offering this to you. We want to work in collaboration with you, the customer. And right now, they, they have just decided to double down. If you go to GoodRanchers.com and you put in promo code Nick, not only will they ship to your door as part of your subscription some of the best American-raised beef, poultry, pork, wild-caught seafood, but they're going to give you a pound and a half of free bacon with each order. And, and you want to talk about you want to talk about living in a world of deception. When you, go to the, when you go to the supermarket right now and you buy beef and you're thinking, well, of course, of course this was raised in America. Oh, was it? Well, yeah, it's got a little American flag on it. Oh, 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 I'm so sorry. But I'm about to red pill you on meat right now in the United States of America. Even if it has that little red American flag on it, all right, if that's it, that could have been raised in a feedlot in a different country, you know, eating God knows what, being filled with God knows what. And then it comes over here. And as long as it goes through some of the process in the United States, boom. American product. But you know, that's not what you were thinking when you saw that American flag. Well, you never have to worry about that with Good Ranchers. GoodRanchers.com, promo code Nick. You're going to get American raised beef, poultry, pork. You're going to get wild caught seafood delivered to your door. And if you sign up for one of the subscriptions in February, right? So get a move on, right? It's leap year. What does that mean? That means the Good Ranchers has upped the ante. You sign up for one of these subscriptions, they're going to offer you that 1.5 pounds of free bacon with each order in that subscription for four years. God bless America, right? If that's not an argument to get you to cross over and decide what we believe in liberty and steak, well, I don't know what it is. And maybe maybe you are the problem. I'm just kidding. We love you all. GoodRanchers.com, promo code Nick. Go ahead and check that out. All right. 
So let's get to what is the what is the responsibility of those of us who you know believe in what we do, and I've, I've articulated this a couple of times. What is our responsibility for someone that is coming to us and engaging? Right now, I think right off the bat we need to understand that there are some people that engage in in conversation with you, and they're not giving you an honest hearing. They're just trying to trip you up. They're just trying to make you look stupid. And the way you interact with that person matters. Maybe not to the person that you're talking to, but it might matter a lot to all the people watching or listening in on the conversation. So never never think that just because someone's being a jerk to you, that's automatic carte blanche to be a jerk back. Now, maybe sometimes, maybe sometimes they need a, they need a fastball, right? But a lot of times you need to understand that sometimes the, the, the person that you're reaching out to is not going to be the person directly talking to. It might be the other people listening, all right? There's going to be other people that they're struggling with this, but... They, they are coming to you in good faith to have a good faith conversation. And if you can't adjust your mindset from my job here is not just to win an argument, my job here is to actually show the beauty of a worldview, of an approach to reality that actually produces all the things that they're looking for, right? Meaning, purpose, community, and genuine meaning, purpose, and community, right? So the first thing I would say that, that you have to know is, what do you believe and why, right? I, I know a lot of people that they believe what they believe because that's what their parents believed or maybe that's what their pastor told them or maybe they had a coach that they respected and that's what they believed. And Look, the beliefs have to be yours, right? You, you have to, now again, let me caveat this. Truth is truth. It's not your truth. It's not my truth. It's truth. We can all have various perspectives on the truth, but ultimately the, the goal of getting multiple perspectives when you're, when you're trying to arrive at something is because ultimately there is such a thing as objective truth out there and you're trying to get as close to that as possible because when you have the truth, you can make good decisions about what to do next. And so what I, what I would tell people is that if, if you want to do more than just go off and live by yourself in the woods somewhere, if you want to like actually engage with the culture it's critical that you understand what you believe on a foundational level and then you're able to work up from that, right? Don't, don't work from tax policy down to, down to foundational levels. Work up on the foundational levels and work up from that. So here's the way I explain it sometimes and, and I'll use taxes as an example because most people will sit there and argue between, oh, should we tax this much? Should we tax that much? Should we cut this? Should we increase this? Should we do that? My fundamental question starts with, okay, does everyone here understand that the taxes is the violent confiscation of somebody else's earnings, right? Or, or at least it's confiscation under the threat of violence. Does everyone understand that's what it is? And, I, and I'm not saying this, and I'm not saying this because I'm making a larger argument that, you know, you can't have any taxes, right? Like I, I get that we live in an imperfect world. But there's a big difference between understanding why raising taxes or implementing new ones is problematic and why, why it's morally problematic and why it's practically inconvenient. And the problem is, is that in a lot of the things that we discuss, whether it's property rights or whether it's individual responsibility or whether it's new laws, regulations, restrictions that the government's going to put into place, is that if we're arguing simply from the, the practical inconvenience, well, then if you can move the practical inconvenience for yourself, then what's the problem? If you can move the practical inconvenience for the people that you care about or your group, what's the problem if it hurts somebody else? Unless you have a moral conviction, which is informing what it is that you believe and why. And so one of the, we, we talk a lot about this on this podcast is understanding what you believe and why, right? What, what is it rooted in? For me, it's my faith, right? My, my faith informs everything else. C.S. Lewis had this quote that, you know, I, I, don't, I don't believe in the sun simply because I see it. I believe in the sun because through it, I see everything else. Well, my worldview is informed by the idea that there is such a thing as love. There is such a thing as justice. The two things are connected. There is such a thing as objective truth. There is such a thing as an objective moral law. And I have certain obligations with respect to both my creator and my fellow human beings and the environment and the planet that I live in, Right. I have obligations to all of these things because, you know, again, God says so. And lo and behold, the practical results of following these things, the practical results of me being loyal and faithful to my wife, 
me being there for my kids and supportive of my kids, but also providing discipline, me working hard within a, within a job and using my talents in a way that's productive, not only for me, but for other people, lo and behold, all of those things produce the very results I want. So that's how the world, that's how knowing what you believe and why you believe it is so critical because it's going to inform your actions. And that leads to the second part, which is you can, say, you can say all day long what you believe and why, but do you live it, right? So if I say, if I get on this channel, which I do all the time, and I say, hey, men, it is important for you to protect and provide for your families, but then I don't protect and provide for my family, well, I become a hypocrite. Now, does that take away from the truth of what I'm saying? No. The, the truth is the truth, no matter who says it. But it sure as hell takes away my credibility. And so if someone is now watching me and I'm saying, do this, do this, do this, but then the way I act in my own life demonstrates that I, either, that I don't really believe that, well, then why should they believe it? You could say, well, they, they should believe it because it's true. Okay, but if I'm the reference point they're using for truth, I'm not applying it, and so therefore I'm not getting the results I'm talking about, they may very well assume, well, he says he does these things, but I don't see, I don't see that actually playing out in reality. If I'm the reference for truth, then as far as they're concerned, it's a lie. And you might say to yourself, well, it's not my, it's not my obligation. People have an individual response. Yes, you're right. You are absolutely right. But let me ask you this question. How many times in life have you been confused by something, but you went to somebody that seemed to have their life squared away? They seem to have their life figured out. You, you don't go to your friend that's been divorced five times to ask for marital advice. You go to the guy that's been in a happy relationship for two decades or more. And that's the importance of living it out is that it's, it's not just about being true to what you believe so that you can actually experience the positive results from it. It's also about understanding that whether you like it or not, whether you think it is fair or not, you are a representative of what you claim to believe. And that's critical. And that's your second obligation. Do you live it out? This third one is one that, you know, and this is something that I think we're going to talk um, a little bit more in, in depth, these next two, these next two responsibilities. Can you explain it? And this is one where I feel like there's a lot of people that they're like, Nick, I understand that I, I got to know why I believe what I believe and I know I got to live it out. But man, when it comes to explaining it, that is difficult. And we've, we've even had people, again, very, very you know, gracious people that have, have um, you know, emailed us or emailed the show or texted us or whatever it is and said, you know, I, I, I wish we could explain it the way, I wish I'd explain it the way Christian does or I wish I could explain it the way Tina does or, or Hamilton does or you do. And the thing that I, that, I, that I want to stress here when it comes to how do you explain it is that nobody can be a subject matter expert in, in every field that you're going to potentially discuss or, or every issue that's going to potentially come up, especially when you have somebody that, and I know this intimidates a lot of people. They, they have someone that, you know, they're, they're, let's just say they're tasting the red pill, right? They haven't totally taken it yet. They're just tasting the red pill and you, you're the person right? You're the person that they're kind of using to, to consider these ideas and they come to you and maybe the way that they first test it is they're somewhat combative, maybe not openly like hostile or, or, or visceral or anything like that, but they're questioning and they're not easy questions because the bottom line is if it was easy, they could answer it themselves, right? They want you to answer the hard questions. And if you feel inadequate in your ability to explain what you believe and why, a lot of times the reaction is to lash back out at them. It's to say, oh, okay, well, you know so much. How's your life going, sport? $80,000 in college debt and working at a coffee shop, huh? Yeah, no, no, no. You tell me all about it. Please explain economics to me. You know, I, I've got to, I, my house is paid for. It becomes real easy to engage in that sort of exchange because you feel like, look, you've, You've made all these decisions which are bad, but because you have a degree or because you know, your group has told you this, you think, and because I can't explain to you why free market economics works, you think you have the right to belittle me or act like I don't know anything when, okay, maybe I can't explain it the way you can explain yours, but I'm living my life and it seems to be working and you're living yours and it's not. That's one of the reasons why it becomes important 
to understand how to properly explain some of the things that you believe. Now, again, it is perfectly appropriate at times to say, you know what, I don't know the answer to that, but I'd be happy to get back to you with it because that also demonstrates a certain degree of humility. And sometimes one of the most valuable things that you can do within a conversation with somebody is actually admit what you don't know. And so there's nothing wrong with that. But one of the reasons why we focus so much on the fundamentals and and the underlying philosophy is because, and I I want Christian to opine on this as well and and Hamilton too. I've had people say before, like, you know, when, when you talk about all these situations, how do you memorize this stuff? Or how do you, like, well, okay, some of it is I, I, I'm interested in these topics, and so studying them is fun for me. It, it's not it's not a a boring class I have to trudge to. It's it's fun for me. But a lot of it is I've I've spent a lot of time trying to focus on fundamental principles and critical thinking. And the reason why I've tried to do that is because somebody can always throw a new study or a new statistic or what some new expert said about something. Right? It, it, you can prove anything you want with data provided that you only look at some and you exclude others. You can prove anything you want. You can prove gravity doesn't exist as long as you isolate your data to only the data that's going to prove what your bias is. And so the reason why it's so important and so effective and so uh, you know time um, effective to, to study those fundamentals and those critical thinking skills is because all of a sudden now you're able to ask questions back when somebody makes an assertion about something. So it it doesn't, I don't feel intimidated when somebody says, well, you know, the latest study from the National Health Trust in the UK says that men's trans women's breast milk is every good as women's breast milk. Like, oh, really? So that's what, so that's what you would prefer. Like if you had to choose between the two, you would say equal of those were fine for your baby. Would you, would you say that? And every once in a while you'll get the little pause, right? It's kind of the funny joke when somebody was, oh, Lizzo's beautiful. Oh, really? Okay. You look like Lizzo. And then all of a sudden they get kind of offended. It's like, oh, but I thought Lizzo was beautiful. What, what is it? So what I would tell you is when it comes to can you explain it, it, it is good to have a, you know, a baseline of knowledge and information within a, a variety of fields that you think you're going to engage in conversation on, right? Don't, I don't want you to negate the studying uh, of the areas in which you think you're most likely to engage. Now, listen, if, if you're not a scientist and you don't engage with scientists, well, then you don't have to spend as much time studying molecular biology in order to make your argument, right? But if, if you're going to ha- in, be engaging in conversations with people about various economic things or, or various social things, then it pays to understand why you believe what you do and to go and read people that you can trust that can provide you with the data and the information and the arguments and the reasoning that makes sense to be able to effectively engage in those conversations, I mean, Christian, you, you get this a lot because you, you've studied a great deal um, in, in both politic, political history, uh, and just history in general. W- what do you say to someone who wants to be able to effectively engage on the topics that they, they might find themselves having with coworkers or family or whatnot, but that feel intimidated or feel like they lack the ability to, you know, hey, I, there's no way I can, I can possibly memorize all this information that I need, so what's the point? So I might surprise some people, but the, the, the first thing that I would say is you're, you're not going to win a debate with numbers and statistics and facts and the scientific method and objective measurements of things. We're at a point right now where, where people are denying biological sex and, you know, the fundamental truths, you know, building blocks that science has demonstrated through the scientific method, like basic things about the nature of reality itself, right? We we have a huge swath of the population that are in complete denial about what type of universe we're even living in. And so, I mean, that that sounds a bit black-pilling, right? You know, this episode's about the red pill, but like, I mean, I'm, I might be taking a step even further and, and what we don't want to do is- <laughs> We're doomed, yeah, brought to you by Christian. What, what we don't want to do is somebody that recently became red pill to immediately give them the black pill, right? That that would yeah. create an existential crisis. So <laughs> Welcome, we're screwed. But, but I, I do think that there's, yes. Uh, no, we'll tell you you're screwed in week two of orientation. Week one is about just getting you accustomed to the red pill. No, honestly though, 
I, I think that there's some truth to this. I think for too long, conservatives have been arguing, oh, well, you know, see the marginal top tax rate. When you increase it to this amount, you're going to create a budget deficit, which will then, you know, result in, in debt monetization in order to fill the void. And then that's going to drive up interest rates and in increase inflation. It's going to make everybody poor or, or, you know, you can't fund the federal government if you just tax every single billionaire, hundred percent of all their wealth, you could shoot them all and confiscate all their property. And you'd only be able to fund the federal government for, you know, a couple of months. Like, like, there's all sorts of like numbers and statistics and facts and scientific axioms and truths and objective criteria that you can throw out there. But we've been doing that for decades. If you're on the right, and this is something new that we need to tell people that have recently joined our side, you can come over to the right. You can take the red pill and join our side. I'm, I'm just trying to save you some time if you're going to if you're going to go out there and be like, this is how we defeat the left. Right. You know, we, we need to call it, you know, this we need to say the Democrats are the real racists or, oh, this is all just Marxism or yeah. like we've tried this already. If it would have worked, it would have worked when Nick was trying it when he first got into politics. It certainly would have worked by the time I got involved in politics. Conservatives have been trying this longer than I've been alive, let alone longer than a new red pill person has been a conservative. And so mm -hmm. one of the things that I would encourage somebody that has recently started to take the red pill, that has recently started to move towards the right, recently started to adopt conservative views, or at least recognize that the left has lost their minds, is go and look at some of the arguments that the right has tried to make in the past and ask yourself if they've worked. They haven't. Mm -hmm. And I wish that they had. I, I wish that you could. Well, I wish well, that you gonna, could I'm reason gonna... your way out of a out of a crisis and simply show them the numbers, or show them the facts, or show them the statistics, and that they would stop being a woke, intersectional well, gonna, communist wait, see, gonna, socialist. But okay, I'm going to push back a little bit, not completely, okay. because I, I think you're half right here. I, I think you're half right that there are some people that are so bought into this that you, again, it's impossible to have a conversation with somebody that has rejected the notion of logic or the scientific method as racist patriarchal power structures designed to oppress minority groups, right? Like I, okay, where do we go with that? Right. There, there is no place to go if there is no such thing as an objective reality and tools and mechanisms that we can use in order to discover what that is. If it's just, I'm the oppressor and you're the oppressed and your job is to overthrow this yoke of oppression. And I don't know, oppress me now. Like if that's it, well then, yeah, there's, there is no room, right? Logic itself has become the enemy. And the moment logic and objective truth becomes the enemy, all that's left is fighting. It's violence, right? Like you're either going to hurt me or I'm going to stop you. And that's that's all that we're left with. Sure, I, I do believe that there are some people that are potentially so far gone that there, there is no, there is no you know, great argument that I'm going to provide that's going to convince them otherwise. But the whole purpose of this show is to talk to those people that are willing to consider Right, they are they are willing to consider. They haven't completely given up on objective reality, but they've been so immersed in certain ideas that for them that is objective reality. And what and what has happened is is that it's not adding up. Something isn't working. Right, the 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 promises that were made for you to accept certain things have not been delivered on. And so now you're starting to question because you haven't given up on objective reality, logic, truth, the scientific method. Right? You haven't completely given up on those things. And so you're, you're questioning. And the ability for someone on our side to be able to ask good questions, and this is, this is one of the reasons why I say asking questions can be in a su super effective way to engage with somebody, especially if you don't feel like you're a subject matter expert on the topic that you're engaging in. Asking basic fundamental questions that, that challenge assumptions is critical. Right. So it, again, if, if you're going to try to get into, if you're going to try to get into an argument with somebody that they are just absolutely passionate that, you know, the, the world is going to disintegrate, you know, okay, I'm being hyperbolic, but the, the world is going to experience $500 trillion worth of damage within the next hundred years if we don't drastically alter our entire economy based off of green energy. Right. And this is stuff coming from people like Robert Reich. Right. If you're, if you're debating with someone that honestly believes that, then and you're thinking to yourself, well, I haven't read all the Kyoto protocols and I haven't read all the science on this. So can I can I even engage? Yes, you can. You can ask very, very basic questions. For instance, when somebody says, Oh, well, you know, we we have to get rid of, we have to get rid of all of the um, you know, fossil fuel driven cars. We have to go to the to pure electric electric vehicles. Like, okay, well, what does that what does that look like? 
right? Start at what, what is what would it look like to actually have to do that? What would we what would he have to do to actually accomplish that? And what you're going to find is half the time they don't know half as much as they think they know about a particular topic. But you didn't you didn't tell them they were wrong. You didn't tell them they were stupid. You didn't tell them that was unreasonable. You just asked, so how would you go about doing that? And then, yeah, it, it pays to have some understanding of what it actually takes to do that. Like, so for instance, like, okay, have you ever seen a cobalt mine in the Democratic Republic of Congo? Do you know that 30% of them are, are artisanal mines, which are being farmed by, you know, children or, or being mined by children? So it, it's a combination of knowing, like getting in there and studying, right? There's no substitute for not studying. Like you got to do that. But sometimes just asking basic questions about how how would you do that? How would you make this thing that you desire happen? And what would you have to do in order to do that? And is it worth it to you to do that? And would it actually achieve the results? And what you're going to find is that most of these grandiose ideas or most of these things that have been have not been well thought out or, or they're hiding over a mountain of horrible consequences. One of the best questions I, I asked somebody when they when they hit me with the green energy thing, I said, well, they said, well, what do we do about, um, you know, what do we do about all these climate deniers? I said, who's denying the climate? What do I mean? They're, they're denying climate change. Okay, who's denying climate change? Well, well, they're denying it. Okay, so what you mean is what they're denying is that it's as a big a problem as you think it is. Well, well, yeah. Okay, well, do you see how we went from half the population is denying the climate to we disagree about the nature of the concern or the, or the, the depth and breadth of the concern? And then I said, okay, well, it seems to me that the way that you want to address this issue is by giving the government a lot more power over the economy and property rights and energy. Well, yes. Okay. Can, can you look to other governments in the world that have had the degree of power and control over the economy and property rights and energy that you're talking about? Places like communist China, places like the Soviet Union, places like Cuba, places like... Are any of these countries that you think have a better environmental record than we do? Are, are any of these countries are ones that you would want your child to to raise up in and be confident that they were going to be able to have food and heat their homes and get a good job? If the answer is no, well, then maybe we should question some of the assumptions. Right? That, that didn't require me to have a depth and mountain of knowledge about climate science. It just required me to have a little bit of understanding about some of the assumptions that they were bringing into the con the conversation. And that's what I'm talking about when we when we're talking about how do you explain it? Because I totally agree with Christian that if you're if they're throwing stats at you and you're throwing stats back, well then what's going to happen is they stick with their stats, you stick with yours and nobody's convinced of anything. But if you can actually open someone up within their own assumptions and they start to they start to dig in because you've asked a question rather than told them they're an idiot. I think you'll be shocked at how far you can actually go down that path and how productive the conversation can actually be. But to Christian's point, that generally only works with somebody that it's actually willing to have an honest conversation and, and question their own ideas. Um, to, to respond um, briefly, yeah, please, Nick, please. Have you ever? You, you might have seen this meme before, where it's like you know somebody says, "Oh, you know, climate change is going to destroy the world. We need to you know completely uproot our socioeconomic system in order to yeah. deal with it." And then the next panel, it's somebody holding up a folder saying, "Well, how about you know we try nuclear?" And then the next yeah. panel is the guy's like, "No," and then he takes the folder and he lights it on fire. And then the final panel is, "I don't want nuclear energy. I want to uproot our socioeconomic <laughs> system." And yeah. so that is what I was trying to get to, and what I was saying previously yeah. that that it. It does not it, – many of the arguments that conservatives have tried, and this is why we're, we're where we are. This is why you've taken the red pill because many of the arguments that conservatives have been trying to make haven't been successful. We can talk about nuclear energy or we can talk about the, the actual impacts of you know, climate change or we can talk about you know, the, the impact, you know, the, the rise of, of mental health crises within you know, people that have fallen into modern-day feminism or the transgender ideology or gender ideology in general or any of the sex stuff that – that they're now pushing within like the public school system or in the university system for that matter. Like we can talk about how damaging all of the, you know, economic policies that they're advocating for is. We just went through one of the largest periods of inflation in all time. Has that really shut up the MMT people? Right? Like, like yeah. th there's so many examples of things out there, especially in the cultural realm where there is no, logical, reasonable, objective, scientifically measurable, truthful way 
that you can argue your way out of what is effectively a, a pseudo religion, an atheocracy. It's a religion without God and without morality and with no redemption story. Right. I, I, well, and, and so that's what I was trying to get at that, that for, for so many people that recently become red pilled and then they want to red pill other people, or they at least want the left to stop being crazy so that way they can go back to being on the left. Because again, I left the left, the <laughs> left didn't leave me, which means that some of them are still on the, the left. left yeah. Right. I, the, they're going to try to argue their way out using the classical liberal positions that they have. And when I say classical liberal, I don't mean libertarian. I mean classical liberal in the literal sense. Uh, it, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. You can't rationally argue somebody's way out of a belief system that they hold irrationally. The biggest problem facing conservatives is, is that they believe that rational arguments still work in what is unfortunately increasingly an irrational world, which is why so, I think that that there is some truth to be said about you know, Nietzsche warned us about this when he brought up, like, you know, when he warned about the death of God over 100 years ago, well over 100 years ago, like 120 years ago. He warned us what would happen. Now, he he had a different conclusion, and he was optimistic, and I, I think he totally got that wrong. But he was right with with the, the consequence of what would happen. Oswald Spangler did the same thing when he wrote about the decline of the West over a century ago, like before the rise of like Nazi Germany and World War II. I think he wrote this in like the 1920s or something like that, where he said that eventually the West would walk away from science itself, despite the fact that the scientific method has its roots within Western civilization and precisely within Christianity for that matter. And, and you have people that were predicting this stuff before any of us were even born. And, and, if they were alive today, they would be like, oh, I was totally vindicated, at least on this. Again, maybe their conclusions, in Nietzsche's case, he was totally wrong with his conclusion, but he was right with what would happen when people walked away from some of these, these pillars that uphold well, society but, itself. And those things you cannot prove using well, but here's, here's the, the scientific okay, but method here, or using facts and logic and reason. You're not going to defeat the left using the Ben Shapiro strategy. Okay, so here, here's the part where, again, I'm going to push back about halfway. Okay. Because I, I'm not suggesting that if someone believes something whole, wholly irrational, that you can win them over with rationality. If they believe something totally illogical, that you can win them over with logic. What it really comes down to is if somebody has rejected logic, if somebody has rejected reason, well, then yeah, it's going to be really difficult to win them over with logic and reason. They don't accept those things. They don't accept it as, as intellectual currency. I get it. But once again, when we talk about what we're talking about, we're talking about people that have either been red-pilled or are considering being red-pilled, yeah. right? Like it's because they haven't given up the very things that you're talking about. And and this is the part where I want to kind of go into this, this third category. And this is, okay, well then how do you win the argument? Because if it is like, well, you just can't do anything. It doesn't matter. None of this no, works. No. See, we're all you screwed. You can do something. Right? I just haven't gotten to that okay. yet. Well, and that's that's the part I want to talk about next year because I think there's, there's there's two things that when we talk about the responsibility that we all have with respect to knowing what you believe, um, living out what you believe, and explaining it, and and hopefully explaining it in a way that is um, inviting, right? But but part of the other side of this with with how do you win? And and we've talked about this on two level. One is one is kind of this this practical component with respect to how you live your life and what you do and the and where you choose to spend your time. And, and the other has to do with to the extent that you when you have an opportunity, and, and this is that red pill moment, right? When somebody is when somebody has either been red pilled and they're new to this and that's the whole deal, right? It's what is your obligation at that point to either get them to take the red pill or once they've taken the red pill. To, to basically be welcoming, right? To be inviting and not just, you know, hit him over the head with, yeah, it's about time, moron, right? And, and look, I've been guilty of this before. I, I remember when when Anna Kasparian, Anna, Anna Kasparian? Anna, from Anna Young Kasparian. Turks. Kasparian, thank you. Um, she was talking about how, well, I don't like this, this, and this. And my response was, gosh, is this the consequences of somebody's actions? And and people are like, why are you, why are you trashing somebody who's actually saying something that we agree with? And, and a part of my reason was is because she still doesn't understand why she agrees with us. And this goes back to what you were saying before, right? It's this idea that, oh, I didn't leave the left. The left left me. And so what you're saying is, oh, okay, so if the left backed up five paces, you'd be right at home without ever understanding that they were always going to go five paces and then five more and then 10 more and then 20 more. Like if you don't understand that there's something fundamentally flawed with this worldview, then I don't care if that you're with us now 
if if five minutes ago you'd be right back to fighting us on everything else because you don't seem to understand the fundamental flaw. And I think that is the I think you did a great job of articulating what some of the greatest frustration is. And again, when when Brianna was asking about this, she's like, look, you know, on some of this stuff, like I'm new to it. Like I, I'm I'm giving you all a hearing and and I've been convinced by a great deal of it, but understand you're you're you are now competing with years of a way I thought about something. You're now competing with friends and family. Like I've, I am willing to actually, you know, damage a lot of those relationships because I don't think it's true anymore, but my gosh, can you give me a break if I don't fully know or understand everything right now? And I think that is one of the things that when we talk about winning this argument and when we, when we look at that, the story that I kind of read out in the beginning of this whole podcast is when somebody has actually been willing to leave this worldview or at least question it or challenge it, are you the sort of person that they can feel comfortable and safe and confident with testing these things out? Yeah. Or are you the sort of person that is going to drive them right back into the arms of where they came from? Because as bad as that was, at least they weren't the jerks that you are. I'm not saying you, I'm just talking about us in general. I I think I understand now why we were having like some back and forth disagreement here because we actually – we actually weren't having a disagreement. We were talking about different groups of people. You're talking yeah. about the new, the newbie red pills, you know, or, or red, red pillars. What I was talking about earlier was those newbie red pillars trying to speak to their former friend group that are taking the blue pill, oh, that are the it. woke intersectional yeah. leftists that haven't yeah. taken the red pill, and they're trying to give them the red pill, and instead they're saying, I'm not doing this. This is all white supremacy mumbo jumbo. Yeah. Or like, you yeah. know what I mean? And yeah. so you're a turf, JK. And, and, and then and then so and the newbie red pill, you know, person trying to make the same arguments that we on the right have been making for generations now and then learning the the hard lesson that we have learned already that it's not enough to just appeal to logic and facts and reason and to simply say wow yeah. imagine if the roles were reversed or it's the democrats that are really the the racist right like like all these these rhetoric you know tactics and and lines of reasoning and and things all of them are true by the way all of them are true it is objectively true that when democrats say things like i oppose vote or ID because it disproportionately hurts black and Hispanic voters. What they're effectively saying is that they think black and Hispanic voters are too stupid to get a voter ID. Yes, that's the bigotry of low expectations. You're absolutely right that if the roles were reversed, they would deserve to be called racist. But it is also true that none of that matters. None of that actually makes a difference. None of that will convince anybody. And it's a sad truth that that's the case. You're also absolutely right that sex is a binary. It's a biological truth. There is no denying it, but it's also true that that does not erase the grip that transgender ideology has, has had on our culture and especially on millennials and Zoomers. You can argue all day long the scientific method and they will respond with the scientific method is an example of white supremacy, which is <laughs> absurd because the scientific method works in any civilization or culture that uses it. Okay, but but here's, here's I, what I'll say. Even, even then I'm going to push back because it, it's... <laughs> It's this idea that because that because effectively, well, let me use a different term. Um, because arguing for the truth doesn't convince everybody, it's a waste of time. And it's like, no, it's it's not a waste of time for two reasons. One, like we said earlier, you can ignore reality. You can't ignore the consequences of ignoring reality. And what ends up happening is what what ends up changing somebody's mind, usually is when they run right into that brick wall of reality and they're like, holy crap, that didn't work. So what does work? And then then they're at a point. So you're right. It's not that you having that argument. While they're running full on into the brick wall and they're absolutely convinced this is the correct thing to do, you saying, dude, that's a brick wall might not work. But once they hit it and they turn around and they go, what the hell was that? You say, it was a brick wall. It was that brick wall I told you about. And they're like, you did tell me about the brick wall. The, the, that was a brick wall, it, right? So yeah. the point is, is that it is frustrating. But and, and I will also say this also comes from a position of having children, right? From so I have kids. I've been in the situation where, again, it's not that I'm smarter than my child. It's that I have a lot more lived experience, a lot more knowledge, a lot more understanding of how the world works. And so when I say don't do this because this will happen. Right? It's not because I can guarantee they'll listen to me and execute it perfectly every time. I tell them that in the hopes that it will prevent them from doing the thing that hurts. But I also tell them that because if they do the thing that hurts, 
they're probably going to remember that I told them it would hurt. And it does two things for them. One, it helps them make sense of what happened and it lets them know that I was giving them good advice. And it increases the odds that in the future, when I tell them, don't do that because it'll hurt, they'll say, you know what? They were right last time and they've demonstrated they care about me. That's why it's still worth it all. That's why the arguments are still worth it. One of the, one of the nicest things, I mean, we, we got a, I got a direct message on, um, I think it was on Instagram um, a while back. And it wasn't just directed toward me. It was directed toward everybody at making the argument. Myself, you, Christian, you, Hamilton, Tina. And, and it was um, a, a young lady in Hungary. I won't say her name because she didn't you know, give me a, but you know, again, on the other side of the world. And she was describing how she grew up and the things that she believed and why she believed them. And as I'm sitting here and she's explaining everything, I'm, I'm going, I, I get it. I get why I get why she believed everything she believed. I get why. It made sense. She didn't believe in the things that she believed because she was being irrational or illogical. She was believing in those things because in her world and in her, her scope of experience, it made perfect sense, but it wasn't working. And she understood that it wasn't working. And she started to question the reasons why she believed certain things. And then she gets into saying that watching our podcast has become an integral part of her life now. That the podcast is one of the go-to places that she goes to, to hear the sort of ideas and concepts that we're talking about because it was, it was one way that she could be exposed to those ideas and they made sense to her. And all of a sudden, she wasn't alone in thinking these things. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's, why that's, really like, that, that's, why, that's a really humble That's a really humbling thing. Saying. To... It, no, it's incredibly, I mean, because there, there's always times where you wonder, like, are, are we doing this right? And, and I mean, honestly, when I'm down here in Richmond, I start to go into like, you know, combat mode, right? I feel like I'm, we're fighting over bills and we're fighting over the budget and we're fighting this. And how do we talk about this? And how do we, you know, and, and, I, and I do, I get adversarial. And like, it was amazing because I, I didn't see this note that she had sent the day she'd sent it. I sent, I saw it yesterday when we were talking about what we were going to do and, and what we were going to talk about. And, and it was like this, I, I even, I wrote her back and I, and I thanked her and I said, gosh, you know, I, I know, I know I'm not seeing this when you sent it, but man, I feel like I'm seeing it when God needed me to see it in, in part because it has become very easy when I'm down here and I feel like I'm in the thick of this fight and I feel like I'm fighting in a situation that Christian, you've been describing where it doesn't matter how good the argument it is. It doesn't matter if I've got my facts and my data lined up, none of it matters, right? It's just back and forth. And I feel like the arguments are just colliding against one another and, and accomplishing nothing. And it gets frustrating. And then lo and behold, I'm reading this where something we said or something we did or the way we talked about it mattered. And it, it's both humbling, but it's also a reminder that there's, there's a responsibility that doesn't just rest with, with what we're trying to do here. There's a responsibility with understanding that it will, get it will get incredibly frustrating attempting to share the truth, right? And I, and I don't say that in an arrogant sense as if we've got it all figured out, but sharing something that you have found to be true through experience and through testing and through logic and, and feeling like it's not going anywhere, feeling like it's not accomplishing anything. And it can be real easy in that moment to convince yourself that either A, you're not good at it, or B, it's just not your responsibility, or C, it's just not worth it. And you're just going to go do, you're just going to do whatever you want to do because screw it. And I got to say, it, was, um, it wasn't just humbling for me to read that, it was convicting. Because I started to look back at, you know, various ways I've argued down here or various arguments I've made or, or various attitudes I've had where I've been like, you know what, forget it. And we don't get to do that. We just don't. It's not to say that there can't be times where we get uh, frustrated. It can't be, <laughs> there aren't times where we need a break. But we don't get to quit. And the reason we don't get to is because the things that we're talking about, the, the, the truth that I believe that we're talking about doesn't belong to us. 
We're merely advocates for it. And figuring it out and constantly testing the way we, we discuss it and the way that we apply it and the way that we live it is critical because that is the way that civilization advances. That is the way that you save the things that you care about is that you actually share it with future generations or your current generation. Now, ultimately, you can't be responsible with what they do with it. That, that's, a core, that's a core fundamental belief uh, for us is that ultimately people have to make their own decisions and bear the responsibility of those decisions. But we're still responsible with what we do with the time that we have. And, and again, I, I'm a Christian, so I believe I will stand before God one day and I will have to give an account for what I did and how I did it. Was I a good representative of what I believe? not just simply for my own sake or, or to be able to provide a, a good answer or at least the best answer possible, but because I desperately care about the people around me. And I think it's important that we have some care and concern for humanity in general, because I believe that we are created in the image of God and as such have inherent value and are worth saving. You know, and to the extent, and to the extent that it's, our responsibility to engage with that and figure out a way to do it. I think it's not only, I think it's not only something worth doing. I think it's a responsibility. You know, Nick, um, there, I, I, I want to talk a little bit about some of these solutions a little bit more because I was bringing up earlier, you know, you can't do this. You can't argue with somebody that's taken the blue pill using facts and logic. Like I yeah. used to believe in the Ben Shapiro model and, <laughs> It doesn't work. It, it, it doesn't work with indoctrinated people. But if, you, if you're a newbie that has taken the red pill, I, two people that I want to recommend that you listen to, one is more famous than the other, is, is Jordan Peterson and Carl Benjamin. Carl Benjamin is previously known as Sargon of Akkad. Both of them were on the left. And both of them went through a really difficult period of time. In many ways, they're still going through a very difficult period of time where they're... they're holding themselves to account for what they previously believed in and advocated for and, and realizing the consequences of what that was. And, and they've gone through deconstructing their previous leftism. It, it was until recently that they both identified on the left. And Peterson is paying a huge professional price right now for, for the deviancy he's taken from left-wing orthodoxy. And I, one thing that I, I, um, you know, hold hold them both up in high regard for is is the level of, level of humility that they've approached, you know, recognizing where they were wrong. And it wasn't that they were wrong when the left, again, crossed their sacred red lines, right? It, it, it was, no, the entire left-wing project was wrong from the inception. The rev It wasn't that the revolution went too far. The problem was the revolution itself. It, it was, it was, I mean, here's a good, a good example. The problem is not the Russian revolution went too far. The problem was the communist revolution itself was the problem, <laughs> yeah, right? It wasn't, yeah. it wasn't that, oh man, it, things were great until this Stalin guy came along. No, it was terrible when Lenin was there. It was terrible when Trotsky was there, right? And, and they both have recognized this in different ways. So for example, and this is a very controversial example, but Peterson and Benjamin both identified as atheists until very recently. They still do in some ways, but they're, mm. they're moving away from it. And, um, you know, I watched this interview once where, where um, Carl Benjamin was once talking about his own upbringing. He was in the UK. Jordan Peterson's from Canada. And he brought up that, like, you know, I, I was an atheist my whole life. And I didn't really choose to be one. I just grew up in this culture. And I believed in it. And I thought these people, you know, these religious people were all stupid and backwards and wrong. And now I realize that, that almost everything that we believe in in the West is starts with this foundation of things that you cannot necessarily prove using, again, two plus two equals four. Yuri Bezmenov talks about this in some of his lectures in the 80s. He, he yeah. wrote up on a, on a chalkboard, you know, how many people he wrote, two plus two equals four on the, on the chalkboard. And he said, this is true. This is a mathematical truth. This is as true as anything in the, in the physical world. How many people are willing to walk up here and say, two plus two equals four and shoot me for it. I'm ready to die for it. Nobody is ready to die for that, even though this is true. And yet millions will sacrifice their lives for things like God for things like Jesus Christ, which are things that you cannot prove using mathematical 
formulas, which are things, and I don't care if people try to bring up, you know, Gödel's incompleteness theorem and stuff like that and quantum <laughs> mechanics. You can go down that route and it's very fascinating. I've gone down that route as well. But ultimately, the only thing that you could possibly prove using that is the unity of something. But that doesn't prove anything other than simply it refutes materialism, which isn't enough, right? And so like, I, point is, is that there, there, there's things out there that have formed the basis of Western civilization, the basis of the things that you hold up, like the scientific method, or like, you know, the binaries of sex, or, you know, the importance of the difference between men and women, or, you know, the argument that maybe we shouldn't be mutilating children at the age of eight when they can't even get a, they can't get a loan or they can't get a tattoo, but they can go through life altering surgery, right? Like, yeah. like yeah. some of these basic things that people who used to be on the left that are in looking on in horror at, right? The, the, the framework that they've been operating on has been based on something which they were a participant in helping to deconstruct for so long. And many of them are now realizing, you know, the, our ancestors who came before us, my parents or grandparents or great-grandparents, let alone anybody that was born even before that, they were not all just backward, stupid peasants that lived in an unenlightened world. They had a level of knowledge that, quite frankly, we're discarding and we're missing now sorely. And, and, and we need to appreciate this, which is why I think you're seeing in some respects uh, the beginning of, of potentially a religious revival among people that were on the left previously and viewed these things as worthless. And now they're realizing that, no, we're paying a terrible price as a civilization once we threw this out the window because – People are now rejecting all of these things that I know are true. The scientific method is true. I know that, you know, mathematical truths are true. I know that sex binaries are true. I know that all these things are true. And now, and now we can't even agree on, we can't agree on two plus two equals four anymore. Right. And so yeah. I, I give credit to people that were on the left that have taken the red pill and have owned up to their mistakes in a, in a, with a bit of humility and are, are realizing that what I was arguing earlier, that you're not going to convince people, and this gets into the solution, right? It's not just about taking, you know, responsibility and we're going to blame you, us who've been on the right longer than you. No, that's not the that's not the point. The point is not for me to blame Jordan Peterson, right? That's not the point. The point is to present a solution for how do we go forward. And I would submit to you that the way that we go forward is not just to make the argument of destroying the libs with facts and logic, because we can do that all we want, but that's not going to convince everybody. It's not going to convince even, I think, a minority of people. What we do is that we live our lives in a way that speaks to a level of truth in the actions and consequences of how we conduct ourselves in the world. So, for example, to use an analogy, in the Lord of the Rings books, and I love using this analogy. In the Lord of the Rings books, there's a, there's a chapter in there where, you know, Frodo learns about the ring, right? He, he learns that this is this terrible, you know, artifact of doom that could destroy the world and Sauron's, you know, will is in, infused into it. And he has this huge responsibility on his shoulders. And, and he tells Gandalf, his friend, you know, he's like, I wish this hadn't happened in my time. I wish that we hadn't rediscovered the ring now. And Gandalf replies and says, you know, well, so do I, but so do everybody who lives in the world. But we don't get to decide that. That's not for us to choose. All that we get to do is to decide what to do with the time that is given to us. And so I would submit to you that the way that you beat the intersectional woke left, regardless of whether or not you were on the right from the moment of birth or you decided to convert to the right in your teenage years like I did, or, you know, you're somebody like Nick that has been professionally working in electoral politics on the right. He's, he's you know, he's an elected official in, in the Virginia legislature, and he's been on the right far longer than I've been alive, right? Or if you just joined recently, last week, if you took the red pill, right? It doesn't matter what stage of that process you are. The solution is still the same. It is not to argue the scientific method. It's not to argue two plus two equals four you should still do that. You should still believe in these things because they are true and, and they're useful for the advancement of civilization and society in a practical, physical way. But there's a spiritual element to this that is being forgotten. And I think it's starting to be rediscovered. And that begins with how you live your life. We know, and we've done whole podcasts about the explosion of mental illness on the left the misery and despair and existential nihilism that has gripped the left because they've discarded all of the ancient truths about this world that 
previous generations before us discovered way before we had the scientific method, way before we had biology and and modern day mathematics and computers and iPhones and everything, you know, all the conveniences of the modern world. And yet people before us a thousand years ago lived happy lives, despite all of the death and misery around them. Rediscovering that, which kept humanity going through some of the darkest times, is how you're going to defeat the intersectional woke left. As Yuri Bezmenov said, you don't need to launch bombs and rockets at the Soviet Union. He was speaking in the 80s, right? You don't need to, you know, physically go fight those that are engaging in active measures that are pushing cultural Marxism. You don't need to do any of that. You just need to have faith. And you need to exemplify that faith in your actions. And if you do that you will be able to save far more people than if you get up there on a chalkboard and you write out all the mathematical truths of the world and you write out all the scientific truths of the world. All that's true. And all that needs to still be defended. But that's not going to be enough because ultimately humans are emotional creatures and you're not going to logically, scientifically argue somebody's way out of a cult. You have to use a form of spiritual or emotional warfare in order to do it. And I think that is going to lead to far more success than simply saying, wow, imagine if the roles were reversed. I thought that <laughs> might just close there. <laughs> no, I, thought that, no I, I really do think that was a, that was a great summary because I, I, I do think that there's, again, when we get into the larger question of, of what provides purpose and meaning in life, like you said, two plus two equals four is useful, um, but no one's willing to die for it. Um, but I look at my wife and I look at my children and, um, and I consider my faith. And those are things I'm willing to die for. Um, those are things that I'm willing to sacrifice for. They're also things that I'm willing to live for. And, um, you know, it's, it's interesting to the extent that we've had um, people contact us, and this goes right to Christian's point, to the extent that we've had people contact us that have said, you know, I used to think one way, but I'm really starting to, to question a lot of those things. It has never started with, because I really enjoyed your argument on the Austrian school of economics, right? It's, it's never been because, wow, your, 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 you know, exposition on inflationary monetary policy just really, you know, hit me where I live, right? It wasn't that. It was, it, it usually always starts with um, the way you and Tina talk about your relationship or the way that you guys talk about your kids, or the way that you know you guys will will talk aspirationally, whether it's Christian or Hamilton, about what you want one day from a marriage. Um, this all goes back to what Christian was just saying. It, it's that idea of something rooted in relationship that provides not only something that you'd be willing to die for, but something that you'd be willing to live for. And I do believe that you can you can attempt to bury that under a mountain of philosophy and theory. But at the end of the day, that is what people are looking for. And when I'm able to experience that through my faith and through the relationships um, around me, whether it's my family or whether it's my friends, um, there's something there that makes the argument for itself. And when it's not there, um, all of the truth in the world doesn't seem to convince people. But when they first see that, when they first see that something about this is working, they're far more inclined to ask you, why? And I think that's what Christian was saying, and I'll, and I'll, certainly, um, I'll certainly back that up. You know, we, we talked about the responsibilities that you have if you believe in this and you want to engage with the, the culture. And we said, first, know what you believe, and second, live it. Only then do we talk about explaining it. But I will tell you this: if we had, if we had such a preponderance of people that just did the just just focus on the first two, what do I believe? And I'm going to live it out. And when that manifests itself in the sort of marriages that people want, when it manifests itself in the sort of relationship with your kids that people want, when it manifests itself in the sort of friendships that people want to see, they might not come to you in, in a hostile manner asking you to explain everything. They may just come to you desperate for an explanation for how you did it. And maybe that's where we should start. And the good news is, is I think, um, while it, it may seem insurmountable at times to provide 
uh, a whole host of comprehensive arguments to every potential question that you might be faced with, focusing on on those things and those aspects of your own belief system and the relationships within your life and improving those is ultimately going to be some of the best testimony you ever give for what you believe. Um, and it will invite the sort of questions that will cause people to really look at what they believe and consider something different because apparently it's working. So once again, thank you very much. Uh, I want I want to thank Brianna for uh, asking us to do this episode. I want to thank um, um, Rebecca for um, you know some of the insights she gave as well, uh, which informed some of this episode. And um, you know, again, thank you to everyone out there for for watching. Thank you to everyone out there that has joined our our uh, community chat over in, in Circle. Uh, we go in there all the time. I apologize. I know that being down here in Richmond, I haven't in, engaged as much on the chat pages, but I do go in there and I, and I read and I, and I attempt to learn from that and we attempt to improve what we're doing here uh, from the people that, that take the time to give us that feedback. And um, I, can't, uh, I can't overestimate uh, the value that it has for us. So thank you very much. Uh, we hope that uh, we're, we're providing something that's of value because we know um, that the, the comments and the insight and the feedback that you give us is providing us with value. So once again, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I got a couple more weeks down here in Richmond and then I'll be back in the studio with everybody. I really, really cannot wait <laughs> uh, because there is something about just just being there in there with everybody. And uh, I really just, again, want to appreciate all the work that you know Hamilton, Christian, Tina, Nate uh, have all had to do um, in order to, to make this all work while I'm down here in Richmond. It, it is very much appreciated. So once again, thank you to everyone for joining us. Go check out goodranchers.com, promo code Nick. Get yourself some free bacon, and uh, we'll see you all in the next episode.